Probably one of the best wheels I've ever got. Your four-wheeler? Yeah, it's my stock wheel. Okay. Because I've never been able to have one. My brother enabled me, and he got me one. Okay, so the thing that you treasure is a four-wheeler, an ATV. Um, and you said that it's important to you because it's something that your brother got for you. Yes. So that's that's interesting. Um, and I'm assuming that you have a lot of fun using it. Yes. Is it something you need to keep at home, or does it stay with your brother? Or? It stays with my brother, but I get to see him every summer and every Christmas. Okay. So what for his treasure is a four-wheeler. Pretty good one. Anybody else want to share theirs? I actually do make bracelets with my grandma. My grandma and my Okay, so you chose your bracelets from your grandmother, and that's very special to you because it has a connection to your grandmother, and I assume it helps sort of, I guess, um, of course, nothing's going to replace getting to see your grandmother in person, but it kind of stands in a little bit, wouldn't you say, maybe gives you a reminder of her, it's very special, connects you with a piece of family, that's, that's very nice. Who else? What, right, Catherine? Um, she just gave me some stuff for Christmas. Say again, Donna, I can't hear you. Um, I have a stuffed animal and I'm just eating and stuffed animal. A stuffed animal? And this is special to you? Is it something you've had your entire life? Mm, yeah. Good? Yes, yeah, so I think it's just like... Okay, a stuffed animal. Does anybody have a stuffed yeah. animal of theirs that from like their childhood that they still have hanging around the house somewhere? You do? I actually do. I have my, I had a little Mickey Mouse when I was a kid, and I still have it. It's in my closet. Um, I've kept it all these years. But my children have stuffed animals that are some of their favorite things. Anybody else want to share their thing that they treasure? You have another one? Yeah. What's that? I have a lot of stuff that I treasure. Uh, maybe my trophies. Your trophies? Okay. Uh, football trophies. Football trophies? Okay. I treasure them because I work hard for them. Okay. Games every year, and coach gave it to me. So okay. Good. Okay. I like that. I like that a lot. Anybody else want to share one with us? Well, the idea here, and what we're trying to get at, and what we're going to see in the story we're going to read, is this concept of treasure, or this concept of value. What are the things in life that are valuable? What are the things in the life that are that we treasure, that are treasures to us? And as I'm sure you picked up. With what each person wrote, and even if you didn't share yours, I'm sure yours is probably a little bit different from somebody else's in here. The idea of what has value to us, what do we treasure, it's subjective, which means that it's different for each person. Everybody has something that they treasure um, or that they put a lot of value into that maybe somebody else was. Has anybody ever heard... An old saying, one man's trash is another man's treasure. Have you ever heard that saying before? That kind of connects with this theme here that we all, we all perceive the value in things differently because different things have different emotional connections to us. Okay? Like the bracelets that we talked about over here. Um, you know, those mean something very special because it connects you with their grandmother. Now, to me... Perhaps not. They would just be bracelets to me because I don't share in that emotional connection with them, right? If I see that bracelet, to me, it's just another bracelet, right? But to Jocelyn, it's uh, something very special, right? Your stuffed animal, right? That's something very special to you. To me, it's just another toy. But to you, that's something very special to you because of whatever reason. Your trophies. You can see a million trophies. These are the trophies I see out there in the hallway for our basketball. I didn't win those trophies. It don't mean much to me, but to those who worked hard and played hard and earned them, they're very special to them. So we all have these things that we treasure. We connect to things for different reasons. And that's going to be sort of a theme. You know, what is value? What is treasure? Why do we put value on certain things and not other things? Um, that's something we're going to explore here in our uh, story that we're going to read. Now, we're not going to dive into the story just yet. All right, uh, there's a couple things that I want to talk about first, and um, I would, you need to write this little section down right here. I wouldn't necessarily write it the way that I did. I would actually, because you're going to, um, 
you're going to write the definitions for this later for your vocabulary words. If you want to do it like on top of each other or on two separate papers, that's fine. But I would write this down and leave some space under each of these to write some definitions, some examples, some notes. I would maybe skip three or four lines under each one so you have some space to write. But while we read this story, so the things we're going to do while we're reading the story, first off, we're going to work on analyzing a story. That's going to be one of our objectives, analyzing a story, looking at a story and picking out its themes and the messages that the author's trying to give to us. All right, we're going to identify the central theme of our story. So a theme, which I'm sure you've heard before, especially if you had me last year, because I know we talked about this in sixth grade, but a theme of a story is simply what the central message of a story is, okay? If you had my class last year, we talked about the difference between main idea and theme, okay? Theme being sort of that overall broader message that the author is trying to send to us through their writing, not something that is stated. Main ideas can often be stated in a paragraph or a, or a sentence or something like that. Suspense twice. I sure did, thank you. I put suspense twice. I'll just go with the bias. Thank you very much for that. All right, so theme, um, it's, like I said, it's just our central message. Now, a story will often have one main theme, but we can also usually, if we read close enough and analyze enough and really pick apart the actions and the characters, we can often find other themes within a story as well. So we'll often look at our main theme, what the overall story is about. But then what other themes do we see, maybe maybe uh, <clears throat> smaller themes or sub-themes, what other themes do we see in a story that we can extract by studying the characters, their interactions, their choices? We're going to talk about the literary element of suspense, how authors use suspense to create a mood in a story. Suspense, as we know, is that feeling of anxiety about not knowing what's going to happen next. We use it often. We see suspense often in action movies and thrillers and horror movies and detective and crime dramas and things like that. I'm going to talk about how authors create suspense and different ways that suspense... How, who here can think of a couple ways that an author might create suspense in a story? What might be something that they would do? How might, what might they do to do that? Any ideas? Do what? I can't hear you. Do you have to talk louder? Sorry, Catherine. <laughs> what you say? Cliffhangers. Cliffhangers. Very good. A cliffhanger. Everybody know what a cliffhanger is? The end of a chapter or a movie or a TV show when they don't reveal to you what's about to happen. You can use descriptive language to create suspense. You can use sort of set sort of an eerie mood to create suspense. There's a lot of ways that authors can create suspense. A lot of times being very descriptive and deliberate as the author, as the character is going through a certain action in the story. For example, if you have a character who's walking down a dark and creepy hallway, you might describe the the eerie nature surrounding them, the darkness, the creaks, the fear that's going through the minds of the character, all those different things that can add to suspense. I'm going to talk a little bit about figurative language. That's going to be something that's going to come up in pretty much all of our stories. We're going to be studying different types of figurative language. Um, in this one, we have, um, we're going to see examples of simile metaphor, which you guys are very familiar with, or should be. Remember, simile is comparing two things using the words like or as. Okay, metaphor is just comparing two things. So, he's as fast as a cheetah. Okay, it's a simile. And we're going to talk about a little about bias, the term bias. We're going to talk about how characters have their own bias and how they see things from their point of view. Uh, how they think, see things from their own perspective and then make decisions. So when we judge a situation, we tend to judge it based on our bias, which means our, all the combination of our attitudes, our perception, 
our belief about what's going on or the events surrounding it. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And we may see some other things that pops up in the story, but these are going to be some of the main things we'll talk about. And then, of course, we're going to be learning some vocabulary. These will be on a test when we have a test on Lemon Brown in a couple weeks. Uh, I will be asking you to define these words, so make sure you have them written down. Don't worry about defining them just yet. But we are going to talk about that. So what I'm going to want you to do, listen very carefully to this, what I'm going to want you to do is make sure you're holding on to these papers, and as we read the story, and we point out different examples of theme, bias, figurative language, all that kind of stuff, I want you to make notes in what you just wrote down. Take down examples. You can write them in your own shorthand, however you want, but there will be all the things that you see here and all the examples we'll talk about in this book or in the story will appear on your test. So make sure we're being, and I'll, you know, I'll alert you to the different things you're going to want to, you're going to want to know. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit about these vocabulary words. Okay. Everybody close their book. Mark the page. We're on page four, but mark your page so you can turn back to it. Everybody close your book so you're not looking at the definitions. And let's talk about these vocabulary words and see what we know so far. Okay. So, who can tell me what they believe impromptu means? What does impromptu mean? Without looking at your book. What does impromptu mean? Who's got an idea? Anybody? Andrew, what does impromptu mean? Clear guess. Something is impromptu. What do you think? No? Gavin? Like out of nowhere. I see prom. So okay. Okay, so uh, so Gavin is uh, Gavin is doing a little de deconstruction here. He's looking at the word prompt. All right. To try and break it down. So you're right. Out of nowhere is essentially what it really means is made or done at the spur of the moment or without preparation. So if something is done impromptu, it's done without preparation on the spur of the moment. Anyone ever heard of improv comedy? Improv is um, an improvised comedy? It's a similar word. All right? It means comedy that's unscripted. They just kind of get on stage and start going with it. Um, so if something is impromptu, it's happening on the spur of the moment. It happens immediately. All right? An impromptu game of chess. You're just sitting down with your buddies and you decide to play some chess. Or perhaps you and some friends are hanging out and you all have access to instruments and you're all skilled musicians. So maybe you have a little impromptu jam session. Just get together and play some music without really planning it. Just kind of go where it takes you. Or maybe you and your friends are hanging out one night and your favorite song comes on. You happen to have yourself a little impromptu dance party, right? So that's how impromptu is what impromptu means and how we use it. What about tentatively? Who's got any of what tentatively means? Who wants to give that one a shot? Come on now, computer. There we go. Tentatively. Who's got an idea of what tentatively means? You got an idea, Carmen? Tentatively, anybody? Tentatively? Tentatively means to do something hesitantly or uncertain or, or with uncertainty. If you're tentative about something, you're uncertain. All right? If you tentatively walk into a dark room, you're walking in with a little hesitation. If you're tentatively planning to do something, you're not putting all your stock into it yet. You're just sort of hesitantly, kind of uncertainly planning to do something. What about intently? 
What about intently? Who's got an idea of what intently means? Right here, intently. Anybody? Okay. With intent. Okay, with intent. That's very good. Or in a firm and focused way. With concentration. If I'm doing something intently, I'm very focused on it. It's pretty, almost the opposite of tentatively. If I'm being intent, if I'm intent on doing something, I am confident, I am firm, I am sure I'm going to do it. I am intent. I'm intent on teaching you this story. This one should be a little bit easier. What about involuntary? What does involuntary mean? So let's look at it this way. If you volunteer to do something, what does that mean? Someone tell me. If, I, if you say you volunteer to do something, what does that mean? What are you doing? What? Well, yes, you're helping, but usually that means what? If you if you do something voluntarily, then you're do then what are you doing? You're doing something of your own free will. You're not being forced to do it, right? So, like for example, when I say someone tell me the example, or the definition of, of involuntary. I'm asking you to tell me, volunteer, and tell me what involuntary means. So if voluntary means of your own free will and doing something out of your own choice, then involuntary would mean what? Hmm? Not doing it without free will. Not doing it willingly, correct. So voluntary would mean we're doing it of our own free will, but if you do something involuntarily, it means it's not done willingly. All right? So a lot of times, like if you're forced to do something, that's involuntary. Or sometimes you ever hear of like an involuntary muscle spasm or something like that. You ever twist your arm or sleep on your arm a funny way or something like that and feel like an involuntary twitch or something, something you don't do? That's involuntary. Your body doing something involuntarily, something you didn't tell it to do. Okay? What about trimmer? What's a trimmer? Trimmer. What's that mean? What does it mean to have a trimmer or to feel a trimmer? What is that? You know? Trimmer? Got an idea? It's the only thing I can think of when you say tremor is tumor. Tumor? <laughs> you might get tremors if you have a tumor. Maybe, depending. Anybody got an idea on what tremor means? So tremor means to shake or tremble. You guys have ever heard of tremors in an earthquake? You ever heard of the horror movie Tremors? No? So tremor is a shaking, right? Sometimes we use the word tremor to talk about certain medical conditions. If you have a tremor, then your hands are going to do shaking, or you're, you're, you might shake a certain way involuntarily. It's also, but in general, it's just a trembling movement. If the ground started to shake right now because of an earthquake, that would be a tremor, right? What about commence? Commence. What does it mean to commence? To start. To start. Very good, Gavin. If you commence something, you begin, you start. Commence the race, right? All right, these last two are a little similar, so we've got to be careful about distinguishing between their definitions. Eerie. What does eerie mean? If something is eerie, what does that mean? If I say that something is eerie, what, Catherine? Kind of like it's creepy. Yes, very good. Kind of creepy. Weird. Especially in a way that frightens us. If something is eerie, it's weird, and it freaks us out a little bit. Because things can be weird and not necessarily always freak us out, right? But something that's eerie, it's kind of creepy, weird, strange, and in a way that kind of scares us a little bit. So then, what does ominous mean? Ominous. Intimidating. Intimidating. Threatening. Usually threatening some sort of harm or evil. If something is ominous, it's more threatening. Okay? So eerie and ominous are both adjectives. They both describe something, but eerie usually refers to something that's more weird, strange, and frightening, whereas ominous is sort of like straight-up threatening. 
an ominous cloud. If you have an ominous cloud coming your way, that means you've got a storm cloud, right? Potentially carrying a strong winds or hail or a tornado or something like that. You guys have ever heard the word omen before? You've ever heard of an omen, a bad omen? Where this comes from? If you get a bad omen, it means you're told that something bad is going to happen to you in your future. Ominous. So if something is ominous, it's threatening. Okay? So, continuing on with this talk about the, this stuff about vocabulary, I want to talk about an important word, etymology, etymology, etymology. You're going to want to write that one down too. Anybody know what etymology is? Let's see if we can break this down a little bit. If we see something with the word ology at the end of it, what are we what are we dealing with? What does that word what does that or that what does that suffix tell us? What are we dealing with? Study. Do what? Study. Study. We get ology from logos, which means truth. Okay, but to study something. So biology, the study of life. Geology, study of our planet, our Earth. Anthropology, all right, the study of human behavior. Psychology, study of the mind, okay? So, ology would tell us that we're dealing with a study of some sort, okay? So, we know that we're dealing with a study of some sort. So, if this word somehow relates to our vocabulary, if I'm using, if I'm using the word etymology to talk about our vocabulary, what that might what might that then mean for what this word means? It's the study of something, the study of what? Hmm? Study what? Is it vocabulary? Yeah, how might this if I'm if I'm saying that we're using the term, we're gonna talk about etymology in relation to our vocabulary words. We know that ology means the study of something. So then what do we think that etymology might mean? Take a guess. Take a guess. What you can do is be wrong. What's the fear in that? Fear. What? Fear. Not fear. Anybody else want to take a guess? Etymology is the study of word origins. Where did words come from? Where did words originate? Okay? For example... Our word over here, impromptu, this is why I mentioned Gavin looking at the word prompt earlier, it's kind of starting to do what we're doing here. Impromptu, <clears throat> excuse me, impromptu comes from a Latin phrase, okay, that means ready now, all right? It comes from a Latin phrase that means ready now. You shake that to your Latin class with Dr. R, or Mr. R. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about some of the etymologies, because all of our words in English tend to have roots in Latin or Greek or some other kind of combination of old Germanic languages. But for example, tentative, something that is tentative, if you're doing something hesitantly, comes from a word called, how do we spell that? Tentar, which means to try. Intent comes from the word entendre, and that means to aim, to aim at something, all right? Eerie comes from an old English word, yard, which means timid. So we can see, so what's interesting about this, what I, think, what I find really interesting about this, is the fact that, let's see, center, uh, let's see, to aim, to try, and timid, okay? What I find interesting about this is how some of these words, like I just said impromptu, ready now, 
Okay, impromptu comes from a Latin phrase that means ready now. So if something is impromptu, it's happening in the moment, so it's ready right now. So that's an easy connection to make. Something in tandra, to aim. Okay, if I'm intent on something, I am aiming on a goal, right? That's an easy connection to make. But some of these other ones are a little hard to connect. How did we get a word that means to try to mean to do something kind of hesitantly? How did we get a word that means timid to eventually evolve into something that means kind of creepy or scary? What's interesting about this, when we talk about etymology, is how words change over time, how their definitions change over time, and how these meanings tend to shift as they go through, or as, or as they go with us through all of our cultural changes, our social changes, our changes in languages. You see how words tend to evolve. So this is your new big word today, etymology. Make sure you add that one to your vocabulary list, okay? You're going to want to write the definition for that down. The study of word origins. Does the study of word origins have a word origin? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So keeping that stuff in mind, we've got about four minutes left. So here's what we're going to do. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do for homework. Very simple homework assignment, nothing major. Okay. Please take out your planner. Write this down so that you have it in your planner. Okay. I don't really have a lot of room to write it up here, so I'm going to take it right down right now. On Thursday, what I want you to do is have to be able to turn into me. All right? This Thursday, I want you to write each vocabulary word and its definition. Its definition is right there on page four, so write each vocabulary word and its definition. Okay? Each vocabulary word and its definition. And then below that, I want you to write one sentence using that word correctly. So I want you to write the vocabulary word, the definition, and then below that, write one sentence that uses that word correctly. The correct use of the word in a sentence for each one. Then... And don't do eerie, don't do impromptu, don't do tentatively, don't do intently. I want you to look, pick one of these words, ominous, involuntary, tremor, commence. Pick one of those words, that's all. One, not all of them, just pick one, whatever you want to choose. And I want you to find out the etymology of that word that you chose, okay? Okay. I mean, you're going to have to do a little bit of research online, probably. And write me two to three sentences telling me about the origins of that particular word that you chose, okay? Where did it come from? What are its, what are, you know, like, something like commence has the prefix com com in it. I'm not going to tell you what that means, but you'll see it in a lot of words. So find any one of those four words, ominous, trimmer, come in well. Sorry, involuntary, tremor, commence, or ominous. One of the four we didn't do up here. Okay? And write me, do a little, light little bit of research about the etymology of that specific word. And write me two to three sentences describing it to me. Where did it come from? Is it rooted in Latin? Is it rooted in Greek? Okay? So hold on before you go. Vocabulary words and definitions. One sentence for each vocabulary word using that word correctly. And then choose one of these four remaining words that we didn't talk about over here and write me two to three sentences on the etymology of that word, okay? That'll be due Thursday. And then we'll get started on reading The Treasure of Lemon Brown. And I will have your grades posted.